Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Glad you could join me. Yes, we are, well, still recovering from the opening weekend here in the the Pacific Northwest for many folks. Uh, Couldn't quite do what I wanted to do, but we did something else instead. It worked out just fine. Give you a little bit more on that in a minute. But first off, a great show in store for you. Catching up with a good friend of mine from way back in my earliest television days, Linda Kroll. At that point, she was running a hunting lodge in Harold, South Dakota, as well as breeding incredible Deutsch Drahtars and uh, very active in the German testing system, including becoming a hunt test judge. So we'll be getting all sorts of advice from her on everything from bird finding, dog training, breeding to testing and all the stuff that matters to you and me it's all coming up on the upland nation podcast we'll also share your thoughts from our social media your two cents worth on your own opening weekend well some of you did more than an opening weekend so i will uh, relate some of that stuff to you including some great pictures to drool over hunting reports coming up and a lot more to talk about in that realm as we get deeper into the season. Had a great opener here in Southeast Oregon is where I spent the weekend. It was um, kind of a change of plans. Um, We were originally headed somewhere else. Turned out that that wouldn't work, so we mustered all the troops and got together down in Southeast Oregon, one of my favorite places. Made, (coughs) Made some new friends. On a little creek down there, a little uh, walk-in area that we're allowed to hunt. And uh, uh, thank you for the beers, everybody. Appreciate that. They were well appreciated on a very hot day. Flick also appreciated the chance to soak his feet and a little bit more in that creek. Uh, thank you to Vandy Fielder at uh, Mid Valley Clays as well. All that uh, shooting school advice that you gave me, Vandy, it paid off. I was... I was shooting 75% on wild chuckers and wild valley quail. So uh, you know, whatever you did, you did right. Thank you so much. Um, we are brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Choke Tube. So uh, make sure you say hello when you get to one of their sites. Uh, learn something and uh, tell them I sent you. Well, one of the things I learned many, many years ago that is worth a reminder this time of year when you're kind of just refreshing your memory and uh, maybe looking for spots to visit, um, they're not always those kind of what I'll call the usual suspects. Uh, More information on all of this in some of the articles at findbirdhuntingspots.com. But one of the things I realized early on was you don't need to wear camo or make noise like a duck to shoot upland birds on waterfowl production areas. Yeah, WPAs are a great source of upland birds as well. There's always dry spots near the wet spots. If you keep away from the duck blinds, maybe go in a little later in the day after the duck hunters and the goose hunters have, you know, shot their fill and gone home for a nap. There are great hunting opportunities. I have I have killed sharp tails, pheasants, and even a few quail on various waterfowl production areas in various states. The same things that bring waterfowl in bring upland birds, food crops, sheltering cover, even water at times, especially early in the season or in a hot day. Good management will benefit pheasants and quail as much as the mallards and the honkers. So next time you're traveling, looking for a new place to hunt, take a look at some of those places that are generally developed for waterfowl that might have some nice upland hunting. We're brought to you in part by Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. This time of year, I am doing a mental inventory every time I get in the truck. Yeah, what did I forget? That's why I like to have two of everything. And I can get most of that stuff at the Mid-Valley Clays Pro Shop. Make a note of the address, midvalleyclays.com. Take a look at the Pro Shop pages for shooting glasses, high-quality shooting glasses, hearing protection, those new Negrini cases, Oh, there's gun sleeves and slip cases, range bags, gun cleaning supplies. It's all at Mid 
valleyclays.com. And it's just about time for us to gather. Well, some of us are gathering literally physically in person in Huron, South Dakota for the Fur Feathers Friends event. Uh, HuntHuronSD.com is where I go for all my information. I can get the free walk-in and public lands hunting atlas. There's discount coupons, information on the area. You can get all sorts of deals. It's all at Hunt here on sd.com if you can't make it for the fur feathers friends event come on down for the ringneck festival and bird dog challenge in november 124,000 acres of public access all within one hour's drive of downtown here on hope to see you there or hear about your trip hunt here on sd.com You know, it's been a long time uh, since we actually got a chance to catch up, so this will be fun for both of us. You saw Linda Kroll years ago on Wing Shooting USA, Cast and Blast, and What the Dogs Taught Me, all those shows that I did way back early on, and uh, saw her dogs and her uh, guides' dogs and had some great uh, footage out of all of that. I am so glad to be talking to her again. Linda Kroll, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks, Scott, and ha- uh, thanks a lot for having me. Well, I'm glad we connected again. And uh, si- since we last talked, a lot of lot of water over the dam. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your backstory, uh, how you got into the dog world, and and where you are these days? Well, that goes back a long time. I first started with uh, uh, my introduction to hunting dogs came through my brothers. I had several brothers, and uh, they were all. Um, upland bird hunters and we had uh, English setters and uh, English pointers and it kind of went from there when I got old enough I still liked to wing shoot uh, but I also developed a passion for waterfowling Mm -hmm. so when I first started um, going out on my own and hunting I used to use guides with dogs and uh, decided finally I wanted my own dog and my choice was a German short hair pointer. I put a deposit down on a litter of puppies from a guide that I knew, and by accident ran into a man shooting at a le- in a league, a uh, trap league, who um, had a drawtar. And he started telling me about the versatility of the drawtar, and I thought to myself, I didn't say it to him, thank goodness, but I thought to myself, <laughs> well, you're full of it because there is no dog that points like a short hair and retrieves like a lab. But um, he assured me that it did, and additionally, it was an excellent blood tracker. So I called him on it, and he said, well, I'll take you out to my hunting club if you want to see the dog. I accepted his offer and went out to see his dog, Cricket, perform. And at the end of the day, I distinctly remember thinking to myself, well, I could put up with that ugly dog's looks if, <laughs> if I could have it hunt like that. And that is the truth. And that is how I got my first draw tar because Cricket was pregnant. And I got my first pup from her litter right before Christmas and, uh, of that year. That was back in 1990. And the rest, as they say, is history. You know, it's so funny because so many of us have been exposed in the field and then realized, my gosh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And in the field on that hunt with Cricket, was there one thing in particular that that flipped you over? Was it a performance moment or something? Um, interesting question. Um, and I think that it was not just one thing because mm-hmm. I was – prejudiced against her looks. I did not find her. I, I hate to say it because now I think they're drop dead gorgeous dogs. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was prejudiced because I, I thought she was thick. Uh, she had a lot of coat. She had a beard. Um, she, she wasn't an elegant looking dog in my opinion. Uh, and I was used to the short hairs and the way they moved and their beautiful lines and their elegant looks However, uh, when I watched her work, she displayed something that was 
evident to me, but it was also um, unidentifiable. Uh-huh. Later on, I realized what it was, and that was a, a desire to hunt for her handler without any type of instruction, without any interference. Uh, this dog was constantly, when she was searching the, beer, the bird field, she was constantly looking at her handler and checking yeah, with her yeah, handler. Yeah. And back then there were no e-collars. Yeah. We didn't work with e-collars. You know, this dog just had an attachment to the handler that I couldn't identify at first. Um, and she, she, when she did make bird scent, she was, uh, she pointed, it wasn't regal, but it was a point. Um, and uh, when the bird was flushed, she was, absolute dynamic retriever Mm -hmm. of course then we went to a pond and he threw out some dead ducks and sent her for the dead ducks and she retrieved with the same enthusiasm she was a happy dog and a happy worker and she just constantly looked up at him and i thought you know this is this is a team effort here and this is what i'm looking for out of my dog the one that I, I'm going to get. I want a dog that, that has this contact with me, that has this, this uh, innate ability to just want to work for me, to use its natural instinct, but work because it loves me. And I will tell you that, uh, you know, 30 some years later, after being involved in uh, breeding and, and testing and judging these dogs, I think this is one of the few breeds that are judged at their uh, entry level testing, their VJP, with a um, Arbeitsfreude. And that is, the interpretation of that is the dog's natural display of intention to want to hunt for its owner. How, how did it's it, not? Yeah. It's not. It's not, it is not, uh, it has nothing to do with how well trained that dog is. Yeah, yeah. And it has nothing to do with how obedient the dog is. Yeah. The obedience is taught. But, and of course, the upper level tests, uh, it's all about the training. So that's evident. But in the BJP, the Verbundsjungen Prüfung, they, the judges are, 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 are uh, supposed to, well, not supposed to, they're required to mark a display of willingness for this dog to work for its for its handler. In other words, when he lets the dog out of the uh, off the lead, the first command he gives the dog to search. When I'm a head judge, I say to the man or to the handler, "Do not say anything to your dog. Don't call it. Don't say over. Don't don't whistle it. I want to see the dog hunt." And I want to see this dog going out using the wind, but checking over its shoulder, looking at its handler. Well, and when, and then I make the handler turn, and when we walk in a different direction, I want to see that dog go. Whoops! There goes the boss. I better get over there. You know, without having any any, any kind of uh, interference, I want to see this dog's willingness to hunt for its owner. And this is this is hereditary. This is inherent in in a good, well-bred dog. And there you go. That was my next question. You you cannot, well, to a degree, I think you maybe be able to trick a dog into cooperating more, but it is truly genetic, isn't it? It absolutely is. There's no question in my mind of all the dogs that I have now uh, tested, judged, bred. There are dogs that are absolutely way more likely and 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 have a desire to want to work for their handler than others and it's you can see it and it's it's i think it's breed specific too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and it causes a little bit of controversy sometimes uh when you judge other breeds of dogs that are big running dogs you put them out in a search field and four or five hundred yards they're still going um and that's a desire in the dog to go find game to make game and to hunt However, when a dog gets out of sight of a handler for 30, 40, 50 seconds, two, three minutes, then I have to start thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, that dog doesn't have the desire to hunt for the, for the owner as much as hunt for itself. And this is where you see the Dratar uh, routinely um, 
display this different behavior because it's inherent in that breed. Mm -hmm. And and just for the record, one of my pet peeves is how many people call them Deutsch Drothars. And uh, let's just, uh, from a from a judge in the German system, Linda Kroll, please pronounce the dog's breed name correctly. Deutsch Draht Haar. German Draht Wire ha. Hair. Thank you. Yes. Okay, no more about that. I promise I won't rag on anybody about that one. <laughs> <clears throat> and by the way, my current, the last, in fact, the last three German wire hairs I've had could have been registered um, with the VDDNA. But I just don't have the time or the effort uh, in me to, to test in that world. So let's talk a little bit about that testing program because it's, 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 it is intense. And that might be the understatement of the conversation. Describe the, the levels, some of the components. Let's just, let's just learn more about uh, how that works. Um, well, the, the, the Dratar world the, is tested under the auspices of the uh, JGHV, the Jagsgebrauchthundeverbund. And they actually uh, sanction the tests, the performance tests, they also are the ones that uh, apprentice and approve all performance judges, whether they judge the Dratar, the Longhar, the, the Kurtzar, the Munsterlanders, the Vishlas, all of those different breed clubs test under one testing organization, mm -hmm. and that is the JGHV or the Jagsgebrachthundeverband. So... Uh, the the puppy test, which is the entry level test, is for a one year old dog, and um, they want to test the dog's searching ability in the field, its pointing ability, not how well it's been taught to stand, scent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or to be steady. Its natural pointing ability, its nose, its uh, ability or its interest in tracking and its cooperation and its willingness to hunt for its owner. Uh, so it's a pretty easy test. Um, truth be told, I took my first draw tar to its VJP um, without any formal training. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. And someone said to me, well, it, actually it was the breeder who said, you don't need to train this dog for this test. If the dog is well-bred, and the judges are able to put the dog in a situation that it can demonstrate what's been bred into this dog, its inherent abilities, then that's all they can, they can score it and they will, sure. they will be able to determine um, its, its scores. And so I did, and he did very well. Um, I turned right around and ran him in a NAVDA natural ability test, never having seen a, na a, a NAVDA natural ability test, but I, was in the area and heard there was a test and went there and tested him. And, uh, you know, he did really well in that test too. So clearly somebody was doing something right. And it wasn't me, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the dog just had a great relationship with me and, and uh, did anything I asked him to do. Um, so that's the VJP. Uh, it's, it does not require a lot of training. It does, if, you are, if you're serious and you want to go and, and really get the most out of your dog, you're going to expose the dog and give it opportunities um, to do the best it can at these, at these tests. Uh, one of the biggest issues is it's the, the tracking score that the dog is, is given out of VJP is very important because it's usually, in America, it's usually the only opportunity the dog gets to record a tracking score. Mm -hmm. And a tracking score is required to have this dog entered into, the, into a breed show to get breed certification. Now, in Europe, they, they run uh, tracks not only in their VJP, but in their Herbstzugprüfung, which is their fall test, because they have an abundance of hair in sure. Europe. Yeah. And so there's lots of opportunities to get these dogs on, on hair. 
In the United States, it's very difficult. And in Canada, it's almost impossible. Uh, I remember th- th- there was a time when I was a little bit more deep into this world where there were certain times a year when every every DD owner was spreading the word that they needed rabbits. Right. <laughs> I, exactly. I didn't understand quite at the time what it was all about, but I now I get it. So then yeah. there's then there's that test and then and then you can ascend even farther. I've forgotten the designation for the what I'll call the mature dog test. That's that's called the Verbans Gebrauchsprüfung, and that is the two day uh test of a finished hunting dog. Um let me give you some background on that. In Germany, um, Germany obviously is a very small country, the size of the state of Wisconsin, and there are a lot of hunters. Mm-hmm. People love to hunt, and it's a heritage that is that is that is cherished, and and uh, it's a matter of a great deal of family pride for these people and their their sons and grandsons to all hunt. The problem is there's not a lot of um, of state land mm-hmm. or or free land that the people can hunt. So generally, they uh, get by themselves or in groups, and they uh, rent a piece of ground called a revere. And when they when they apply for the license for this revere, the government will not give them a license to hunt on that land unless they can prove they have certified utility dogs, Verbon's mm-hmm. dogs, so that they can properly harvest the game that's on this revere. And anything that is shot can be recovered yeah. because that is very, very, very important. Anything that's wounded must be recovered and, and utilized and eaten. So you can't even get on a revere Unless you have a license, unless you can prove that you own a, a VGP dog. Wow. So this test is difficult. And there's no way, no matter how good a dog you have, that you can go into a, a VGP without having prepared the dog. It's a two day test, it's, um, um, it's demanding on the handler and uh, the dog. The dogs have to do all their field work. They have to search. They have to point. They're required to be steady to wing shot and fall. Um, once the bird has been shot at, um, uh, they are required to retrieve anything that's 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 killed. Yeah, they're required to retrieve it, and they're required to retrieve it to hand. They're required to come in and sit and retrieve to hand. They're also required in their field work. Uh, there's a there is a dead bird put out, and uh, the dogs are required to, to do a free search without any instruction or handling from the owner. Mm-hmm. The dogs must go out, and when it crosses the scent of this bird, it's required to work into the scent cone, pick it up, and properly retrieve it to the handler. Um, it's required to do two drags, one a feather dra- drag, which is usually a dead duck. The other is a fur drag, usually a dead rabbit, of 200 and 300 meters respectively. Oh, my. With, with two bends in the, ter- in the drag. And a judge will drag the game and drop it and then go and hide. And the handler must, at the start, release its dog release the dog, and the dog has to free track out, follow those turns to the game, pick it up, and immediately come straight back and deliver it to the handler. Without burying, Um, without swallowing, without tenderizing, all those things. That's why the judge is at the other end there. I know, and I've learned that the hard way. Absolutely. And let me me just (laughs) put put in a, 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 you know, a a plug for all of that, that stuff may not sound so important in the field, but for example, uh, over the weekend, we shot four or five different valley quail over a creek bottom that was basically a tangle of willows and alders. And we saw the birds go down. We couldn't get in there, but we knew generally where they were. And I, I had that wire hair of mine and yes, he could be a DD, but he's not. But, um, 
but we train to a uh, to a great degree to the same standard and that dog would go into that creek bottom and bust the brush with only one command and he mm-hmm. searched and searched and searched and every time on his own he brought back those quail and that's Isn't that- isn't that great? That's when that's, it matters. That's those are the things that matter, and and you 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 don't realize it if you just test. It's just a test. But if you're a hunter, you realize, yeah, there's some value to this hunting this hunt test scenario. Uh, oh, absolutely. And if you're an ethical hunter, mm-hmm. the the value uh, is the value of the the hunt is recovering anything that you wound, because that is a carnal sin to to put to put shot in something and not recover it because it's going to it's going to die and then it was for naught yeah so that just goes against all of our principles and so that's why having a a properly conditioned prepared hunting dog is so important so um, after you get out of the field with your VGP dog, then you have to do your water. Mm-hmm. And the dog has to do um, gun sensitivity in the water, um, and he has to immediately enter the water, swim out, and retrieve a duck with a shot fired into the water um, over the dog so that he's not get, he displays he's not gun sensitive in the water. And then he has to go out and do a blind retrieve, across a designated uh, area of water with cover. It has Mm -hmm. to have good cover. The duck is placed on the other side. The dog is sent with a single command, and in he goes and off, and he has to know that his job is to retrieve a duck, and he has to go look for it. Mm -hmm. And then the the most exciting part for me is the search behind the live duck, where they will put a a live duck with uh, some flight feathers pulled into a body of water and let it swim away and hide. Then you bring a dog up and give it a command to search, and the dog is required to go in the water and not run the banks, but go in the water. And um, you won't believe this unless you've seen it hundreds of times like I have. But the dog will actually cut the the, the path, the scent path of that duck, and track the duck across water. And I've seen it. It's, uh, it's beautiful to watch when there is a wind blowing across the surface and it's blowing the scent and the dog will go down five yards and come back up and down five yards and come back up into the scent and down five yards as the scent is dissipating over the water because of the wind. But when, he's, when he tracks it and he goes into cattails or heavy cover on the other side or up a bank and all of a sudden, you know, five minutes later, here comes your dog down into the water and across the water with a live duck in his mouth I'm telling you, it's a thrill beyond belief. Absolutely. Particularly if it's a judging situation. <laughs> but, yeah. Hey, everybody, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Linda Kroll. We're getting deep into the, pardon, into the weeds right there, in fact. <laughs> but exactly. The, the German testing system is, is a fascinating one to me, and, and I'm just grateful that some of the founders of NAVDA have adapted it to the North American uh, world, if you will. Um, <clears throat> dumb question, but absolutely critical. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Yeah, I'm Bistian, oh dear. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> I, can, I can speak musical German, but I don't know what anything means. But you, because you go over there, too, it, it, as a survival mechanism, if nothing else, especially as a judge over there, you got to, you got to, most of them probably could speak a little English, but they don't want to, do they? Um, I found that to be uh, not true. Oh, I, found that, I found that a lot of them will speak English. Um, it, no, if you, they know you're a hunter, you're not judgmental. Uh-huh. You, you're in the fold. Yeah, you know, you're yeah. one of them. If you're over there saying, "I've got a draw tar," of course, by then they know about you because they know you've got dogs. They know yeah. that you passed your your VGP and you've gone through your apprenticeship and uh-huh. you're. You're, you know, you're a judge, and I'm, you're over there judging their dogs, and you're drinking schnapps with them. Yes, they'll speak English. I love um, it. They're more, more. The reason I think that more of them don't speak English is they're just, um, they're so um, leery of saying the wrong thing, of making a mistake. Ah, yeah, it's yeah. not that they don't want to communicate. They do, and they encourage you to. Tr- they encourage everyone to speak 
German, and they understand more than they're willing to speak a lot of times because they just don't want to make a mistake. That's um, that's in, so in essentially German. Yep. Yes, it is. It and is if you understand yeah, them, that's, that's how they are. They're outgoing and 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 very very generous with their uh, with their time and their uh, expertise, willing to share their training techniques, their stories. Uh, if you go over there as a breach judge or as a breeder, I've taken many dogs over there to be bred and sat at the Stammtisch with many, many of the old classic German breeders that have produced so many fantastic dogs over the years and ask them about dogs in the backgrounds. They'll go six, seven, eight generations beyond yeah, yeah. The, pe- the pedigree, and they'll be able to tell you, yes, I remember seeing that dog. My father hunted with him. Wow. I saw him do this. I saw him do that, you know, and um, they're, they're very generous and uh, very warm people, very, uh, very outgoing people. Once you establish that you're there in the fold as yeah. one of them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've had nothing but wonderful experiences with them. Uh, we're just getting warmed up around here at the Upland Nation podcast. Linda, you get about 30 seconds to relax, and uh, I get uh, 30 seconds to um, promote one of my wonderful sponsors. I will do that. We'll get back and we'll talk uh, more practical stuff about the things we're doing right here in the United States with our dogs. So don't go away, everybody. We'll also be covering your two cents worth on all of this stuff that you did last weekend, uh, hunting reports such as it is, and a few pictures to drool over coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. First, I had another chance to be reminded of how well Sage and Breakers Clean Lube Protect Spray can um, take care of your shotguns in the field. We hunt a lot of that dry volcanic dusts in southeast Oregon and northwest uh, Nevada. That stuff, it, it gets in your lungs, it gets in your nose, it gets everywhere, including all over your guns. Well, CLP from sageandbreaker.com has kind of a, I'll, I'll, for lack of a better term, I'll call it an anti-magnetic property to it. So you spray that on, you wipe it off. It makes your metal parts of your shotgun a little less inclined to attract as much of that dust. Of course, it also lubes and uh, and cleans your gun a little bit so you're ready to shoot the next morning or later that day if you've dropped your gun several times during the hunt. So learn more about them and sign up for the mailing list at sageandbreaker.com. And with that, we're back here on the Upland Nation podcast. Linda Kroll is my guest. We first met making an episode of Cast and Blast back in the day and uh, had some wonderful guides uh, working with us over the uh, visit as well, plus you, Linda. One of the things that I I really got a kick out of, and I I really need to talk to you about it because I think you are an expert in this too. Um, You had a female guide, German who had done work as a German Spanish interpreter. And she and I had got a got a kick out of speaking Spanish most of the time. It was more fun than the other way around. But <laughs> she was also the most ebullient handler I've ever met. And she um, used what I'll just simply call baby talk to get her dogs to perform in you know at their peak. Uh, and I've since asked a lot of other trainers about this, and I and I think to a great degree it falls right in line with one of the many theories I've read about dog behavior, period. The reason we can domesticate dogs is because we don't let them grow out of their puppyhood. What do you, yeah, yeah, am I on to something there? Um, I don't know. I know the gal that you're, that you're <laughs> talking about. Um, she's a wonderful gal, actually. Unfortunately, she's passed away. Um, um, but she, I enjoyed every moment uh, I spent with her. Her name was Astrid. Mm-hmm. Uh, lived out in South Dakota for a while. Met her husband, uh, guiding for him out at our lodge. Mm-hmm. Um, moved to Colorado and and spent many happy years with him until um, she passed away a few years ago. And um, everybody was very sad about that. But um, you know. <clears throat> 
With regard to why we've been able to domesticate dogs, I, I don't think it's because we, we haven't let them grow out of their puppyhood. I baby talk my dogs sometimes uh, I, just because it, it comforts me because I want my dogs to be part, kind of part of my family. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. I say silly little things to them. Uh, oh, let mommy get you another cookie, you know, things like that. However, make no mistake, when my dogs are in the field, mm -hmm. they're not puppies. I had a dog in Germany in, in Magdeburg at the first Hegewald I've ever run. And he brought down, uh, he throwed at a ray buck right in front of everybody in a field search. It was the only time in the history of the Hegewald that this had happened. And um, he was no puppy. I mean, he was a young dog, but this was instinct. And when he's out hunting, when most of these dratars are out hunting, they're all business. Yeah. They're grown-up yeah. dogs. If someone would be, if their life would be in danger, let's say, uh, I don't know, something would bust out of the bushes and come after them in a threatening way, I would bet dollars to donuts any dratar I've ever owned would be between me and the threat yeah. in no time at all, putting yep. its life in harm's way without a second thought. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think the reason that we've domesticated dogs so efficiently was because there was a mutual need. Yeah. Um, they, we needed them to help us hunt and to use their skills, and they needed us for excess food and to, to stay alive. And it, uh, they're very intelligent uh, animals, and uh, so it was a symbiotic uh, relationship that, that grew. And, um, yes, we've taken some breeds and created breeds that want to do nothing but sit in your lap and, and shiver. <laughs> but, you know, I guess there's a, there's a place for them. People like those dogs, and they want them, and, and the dogs have adapted very well to that. Um, I don't know that they're particularly happy, <laughs> but but uh, but their owners are. <laughs> yeah, but the owners are. So yeah. so they're adaptable. But um, yeah, as even my young dogs, young dogs, uh, and when I took my dog to Germany that year, he was only 18 months old, mm -hmm. and I'd never seen this side of him before. But when that injured Raybuck broke out of cover. He went after that thing, barreled into it, knocked it over, rolled it, and before anybody could even catch their breath, he was on it and had it by the throat and was killing it in front of hundreds of people. So where did that come from? It did not, that was not puppy behavior. No. That's a, that is a deep uh, a, a hunting instinct that was so primal that I don't think you could breed that out of a dog. You can – disguise it and certainly if you live in the suburbs of a big city you never give a dog an opportunity to display that and maybe thankfully but may make no mistake in, in most well-bred hunting dogs it's there i'll never forget when the germans told me a good dratar is like having a very sharp hunting knife ah. there are there are times when it can save your life but then you always want to be mindful and keep that knife in a sheath. Mm. You know, so, that, those are words to live by. Yeah. I mean, if you're out, if you're out hunting and all of a sudden a, a rabid coyote comes barreling out of some cover and is coming for you, I know what my dogs would do. And I would yeah. bet your dratars would do the same thing. They wouldn't take that very kindly and they would go right after it. You know, I had almost that exact uh, situation happen a few years back, and uh, the, the coyote never had a chance to, to, to test anybody on that. But you, yeah. you make a very good point. Let's 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 come back to the United States, and um, you were so kind to host us and my TV crew and all that, and we had a lot of fun uh, uh, for days and days. And we shot uh, pheasants, huns, sharp tails, and. Uh, just had a wonderful time seeing South Dakota for one of the earliest visits I've ever had. Uh, of all of the hunts that you've done, whether it's uh, on the ranch back there or anywhere since or before, uh, what what which one comes to the top of your mind? Um, in terms of upland hunts, mm -hmm. I, I would have to say South Dakota because of the diversity of birds that 
you have a very good chance of uh, of producing over point, and mm-hmm. that is on our ranch. It, we certainly had uh, a lot of um, um, sharp tail grouse. We were were some of the our area was one of the few areas that still had uh, good numbers of greater prairie chicken. Oh yeah, and uh, we did have some huns. Huns are tough, uh, you know. They they there are certain areas where they can live and survive and but they're very fragile birds but certainly the pheasants so when i would take a dog out um and i'd put three shells in my pocket and op- break open my my double and just walk along behind the dog when it went on point i honestly well there were certain places i could kind of predict but you never knew what was going to come up so it was uh that that was kind of exciting and that was fun and we did have a lot of people who would come to the ranch and say, you know, I've shot lots of pheasants on preserves at different places, um, but I've never had this experience where I can go out uh, in the prairie grass and have a chance at some of these other birds. And, and so it was, the, yeah, that's a, it was a pretty exciting thing. I, I, I hunted uh, parts of the country where I could shoot quail and pheasant um, over point, you know, that was exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but not uh, not quite as much as uh, the excitement that one would feel on a very good day in South Dakota. No, I'll I, I'll never forget. And and actually, there was a, it was a learning moment for me. We were <clears throat> we were in a next. All I can remember is we were next to some some standing sunflowers, and uh, we were in some sort of a cut field next to it. And the dogs were working really, really hard. I think they were your dogs. Um, and they would point and creep and point and creep and point and creep. And eventually, uh, you know, the Huns were getting up in dribs and drabs here and there. We shot a few, and it was wonderful. And the dogs mm-hmm. did some incredible retrieves in those sunflowers, too. And you said right. something to me about what the dog's job really is. And sometimes, at least what I remember from that is, sometimes a dog that just locks up and stays locked up is not what you want in the field, is it? Well, I'm glad you brought this up because this I've had this conversation with more people over the years than any other conversation. And that is, why are my dogs not steady to wing shot and fall? They are for the test. I guarantee that. Uh, I've run eight, eight BGP dogs and they have to be steady to, to, to wing shot and fall. But I train them to be steady to a command because in practicality, when you're out hunting, no wild bird worth his salt is going to sit in front of a predator and sit there and wait for you to come up and flush it most of the time. Most of the time, what they'll do is they'll they'll they realize there's a predator behind them and they run and they try to get downwind of the dog is what (laughs) they try to do or the predator and so if you watch enough and i've done this thousands of times walking behind dogs without a gun when it's not hunting season but there were birds everywhere in the fields and so i take my dogs out and i watch a pup learn to do this and they'll go out and they'll point and then they they break point and they're moving because the bird has moved and the scent has moved the scent has moved yeah the intensity of the scent and so then they relocate and usually what the dog will do once they realize the bird has moved or the scent has moved they go back and forth across the wind Uh whichever way the wind is to them to pick up the strength of that scent again the strongest point and work that so if you watch this whole thing unfold, it's a beautiful ballet uh, between a, 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 an old bird and a young dog. An old bird will teach a young dog a lot. And so, uh, you know, the, the dog will, the bird will try to get downwind and downwind and let the predator pass. Yeah. And if you stand back and watch it, you can see a, a lot of this. But usually when a dog is on point in a practical situation, the hunter barrels right in behind the dog. Now, the bird knows where the one predator is in general, in general terms because, because it, the, the, the sound has stopped. Yeah. The dog is silent now, which is why I, I, 
absolutely dislike any type of a beeper collar on a dog. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I don't like whistles, and I don't like people t- saying anything. I never talk to my dogs when I hunt. Yeah. The dog is quiet. The bird is saying, okay, the, 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 the predator was over there, but now I don't hear him anymore. So I'm going to sit here and see who's going to make the first move. Yeah. But then he hears this other predator, this big, this noisy thing come barreling in, yelling, whoa, whoa, good dog, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Well, what's the bird going to do? It's either going to flush or it's going to run. Most of the time it will run in the opposite direction of the direction the person's, this noise is coming. I have seen so many people with dogs that were beautifully steady to, to scent. They got point after point after point after point and never could get a shot at a bird because yeah. they, couldn't, they couldn't find the birds anymore. And this is why I like my dogs to be hunting dogs. I want my pups to learn. Work that bird. Run in the back end of him. Flush him. You know, l- learn to do that because once you get a dog that will do that, and, and all of it, this is not rocket science. Dogs are born with this. If you let them figure it out, a good hunting dog will figure this out. And when you see this beautiful ballet that goes on between a dog and a bird, and the dog knows he's got to outsmart that bird and pin him so that you can get a shot. He knows his job if you let him do it. If you haven't trained that out of him by making him stand there, when he knows that bird's a half mile away by now, you're, you're still kicking the brush trying to find it. Yeah, it's. But when you see this, when you see this, this is absolutely, uh, the, 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 it's orgasmic to a bird hunter. It, when, when you know your dog has has worked this bird, sometimes a half hour, yeah. 45 minutes, but he finally got him pinned. And you can look in that dog's eyes as you're walking toward it. The dog is looking at you with its eyes on fire saying, I got him, Dad, and he's right there. He's right there. I got him. And you shoot that bird. It is – it's – that's – that is worth shooting 50 planted birds. No no doubt about it. We jumped a covey of valley quail out of a stream bottom uh, on Saturday. Once it was broke up, um, the dog's – started working singles and yeah. and pairs and and I saw this this was in open country so we were able to stand back and we were a little higher than the dog and we just watched that exact scenario play out point nothing there he figures it out he starts all over again as if nothing there was nothing there and he was going to re you know rehunt and, we established uh, contact. Yeah, and uh, and it it's funny you you never think about it that way until you describe it so aptly. It it, it is really several searches strung together based on what which, which was a revelation to me right today when you talked about it, and that is they're sent right in front of my nose. Okay, now the scent's not there anymore. So, hey boss, I'm going to move, and that is something that uh, you know. A lot of us discourage, but you change yeah. you change the thinking in me way back then, and mm-hmm. I, I believed in it ever since. So thank you again for explaining all that. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. That's Linda Krull. We're having a good time talking about all that kind of stuff. You know, what is one of the things, Linda, that when we're training our dogs um, that we probably ought to do more of or do less of? I would say what you what people should do more of with puppies because they don't have uh, ex- uh, the opportunity to get the pups out in in um, cover that hold bird scent <clears throat> or hold <throat> some sort of scent. It doesn't have to be prime pheasant country or prime quail country, but just good cover that holds scent. It might be rabbit. It might be um, any type of uh, prairie bird, uh, you know, meadow larks. Meadow larks are classic, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you'll see a pup start getting a lot of natural instinct. It wants to stop and like, what is that? What's that scent? What's that scent? That's all these little buttons being pushed in their little brain and the lights are coming on. That's something I should stop and investigate. So, if you can't get your dog out in that type of cover, and, and a lot of people can't, what you should do mostly with a pup is spend time with it, 
and obedience. Yeah. Obedience, obedience, because you want a dog, you want to establish this rapport with the dog. You want that dog looking to you for guidance, for everything, for uh, healing on lead, for downstays, for halts, for getting the kennel, proper behavior, get your kennel, even though there's no good reason you may think of to put your little dog in a kennel right next to your chair in the living room while you're watching TV. Tell the dog kennel, put the dog in the kennel, give it a little chew toy and watch TV for 20 minutes. Then let the dog out. You know why? Because you're going to get the dog used to being in a blind in, uh, in, during duck season. Yeah, this is yeah. all a foundation for all of that. You know, I want you to lie down and be quiet, even though there's no reason, just because I told you to. And then it builds this rapport with this puppy. And the puppy looks to you for guidance as it's growing up for everything. And it builds an incredible relationship. So are, obedience <clears throat> is one good thing. But taking puppies out and getting them in fields where they can run and search, not with, a, with an electric collar on them that you can get them back in, but just to have a relationship so you can walk with the dog. And when the dog gets too far out, when a pup is too far out, you turn and you go the other way. Just turn and go the other way. Yeah. Not when there's a bird on the line, just yeah. when you're trying to condition this dog to pay attention to you because this is the way you want to hunt. You don't want to be yelling at the dog, screaming at the dog, whistling at the dog and cursing at the dog and, and beeping the dog. You want that dog paying attention to your body movement. Mm -hmm. And when my shoulders turn and my dog looks over its shoulder, its, its shoulder at my shoulders and I'm headed 45 degrees out another direction, buddy, you can bet your bottom dollar my dog's going to be right over there in front of me hunting because I dictate which direction we go. If you don't do this, the dog is going to do what? He's going to hunt into the wind or cross the wind. Because that's where the scent opportunities are optimal. But at some point, unless you're some kind of god, you're going to have to hunt downwind to get back to the car. And so I need that dog not to question my authority. When I turn and start walking a direction, I want him hunting sideways to the wind, downwind, crosswind, mm -hmm. into the wind. Mm -hmm. Whichever way I walk, I want him to learn to use the wind in that direction. Amen that to that. Is yeah, I that had, is very important. I gunned for a NAVDA test many years ago, and uh, Phil Swain was one of the judges. And he, he, that guy's a walking encyclopedia. And uh, I learn er something every time I talk with him, whether it's on the podcast or in the field. Uh, but Phil pointed that out, and he said, you know what they're keying on a lot of times? Check me on this, Linda. The brightness of your face. That's the one thing they can see from a distance. So if they can't see your bright face, they know they're not going the right way anymore. You ever thought about that? I haven't thought about that. But there could be something to that. I just know that my dogs could tell uh, a 45-degree angle of my body turn yeah, would yeah. bring them back across, back across the field. And, you know, um, you, you can command them to change or they can figure it out for themselves. You want the dog to figure it out for yourselves yeah, because yeah. again, if you've hunted a lot of wild birds and I have, you know, wild birds are, you're gonna, you could be walking for four or five hours and you're on your way back after a nice big long walk that was unproductive, uh, you're, you're hunting grouse. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you're headed back and you're tired and your dog is off, way off to the side and you yell at it. You know, get over here, whoa, whoa. and all of a sudden, off to your left, a covey of grouse get up. You know, you don't, because they're going to jump at you, the sound of your voice. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and there you are, and it's, it's nobody's fault but your own, because you yelled at your dog. You didn't have to yell at your dog. Yeah. I rarely said anything to my dogs, because they learn to hunt with me. They learn to keep their eye on me, because... They, that's just the way they were brought up as puppies because yeah. of all the walks we took in the field. Yep. Absolutely. So, so if we're in the field and, um, and um, we've got a dog working for us, uh, what kind of gear is in your hunting vest that we may not be taking with us that we probably should? Um, 
you probably have a lot more gear in your hunting vest than yeah. I have in mine because I carry very little. I carry I way carry, too much. <laughs> I always carry water. Yeah. I always have a, a bottle of water for my dogs. Yeah. Um, because you just never know what's going to happen if they if they cut their their tongue on something. They need something. I always had water with me. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on where I was, but I generally had a plastic bag with some um, vet wrap. Yeah. Yep. Uh, something, you know, just a little first aid sort of stuff really mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, always a Leatherman tool. Yeah. Always. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of times when I thought of it, I had an e-collar on the dog only uh, for emergency purposes, for example, uh, they jumped a coyote and it was hot yeah. and the coyote takes off and my dog's been hunting for three hours and he's naturally going to want to chase. And if I yell to him, halt, and he doesn't halt, yeah. I want to beep him. So yeah. he stops to save his life. Um, if it's, uh, if I'm out hunting and, uh, there's ice, but the ice isn't, mm -hmm. isn't, uh, trustworthy mm -hmm. and I'm afraid. And all of a sudden a bird, gets up and goes over the pond. Well, I'm not going to shoot it if the situation is, uh, is, is questionable, but if the dog starts into the pond and the ice is, uh, the integrity of the ice is questionable, I'm going to beep that dog to stop it. You know, I don't want it chasing antelope, um, you know, things like that. So whenever I uh, thought of it, I would have an e-collar on the dogs, but not for direction for hunting, but only for emergency situations. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and, a, and a little uh, light um, plastic bag with some medical equipment, some water, and a Leatherman tool. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all I had. South Dakota is one of those places we all want to go to, and, and we do, and we have a wonderful time. I think one of our first visits was, like I said, to your, your lodge at the time. <clears throat> if there's somewhere else that you would want to go hunting, whether you've been there or you want to be there, where would it be? Gee, um, uh, I think probably Montana. Uh -huh. I think there's some really good spots up there that I've never been to. Uh, I mean, I've hunted in Canada and I've hunted in the Northwest down to California, into Texas, across the middle of the country, down into um, the Southeast, and of course, uh, Pennsylvania and New York, I've hunted, but I, I've never been to Mont. I've never hunted Montana, and I've I know friends, good friends, good bird hunters, have found really good bird hunting there. Uh, Huns, mm -hmm. uh, prairie grouse, mm -hmm. and some pheasants. But there's big, wide open country that I like to hunt. Same here. You know, I like the, those great, big, wide open situations where. I have the opportunity to really let my dog roll. And uh, that, I like those place, types of places. The, I'm, I'm regretting it because I was supposed to have come back from Montana about three weeks ago and I never got to go. But oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> for the first time in about four years, but you're absolutely right. The fact that you can stand on a knob and watch your dog work for, uh, you know, which is also a joke. I'll tell you that one in a minute. But uh, you can watch, it's like a little amphitheater. You can watch that dog for you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards. And mm -hmm. if you, you know, Montana is not as flat as a pancake, but in sharp tail country, it's flat enough to where you can watch your dog run away for three days. And, <laughs> and right. you stand on a tuna fish can and you can watch him run away <laughs> right. for a week, but, right. but you don't want to, but, um, but it's one of those places you do need to go. And when you're ready to go, call me. I'll tell you some of the places that we've had luck. But it is Terrific. it is one of the Valhallas, one of the meccas that, that every bird hunter ought to go to for, for a good time. Uh, what about conditioning your dogs? You, you mentioned a little bit about that. But, you know, all of us are at this point in time, at this point in the season, wishing we had done more of it. Do you do anything in particular to keep your dogs in shape? Right. Uh, yeah, I used to. Um... I took it very seriously because my dogs hunted a lot, yeah, way more than obviously than other p people's dogs. Um, so I would start um, in the spring when the can, when the weather was ideal. People don't usually think that far off, but mm -hmm. I would start when the weather was still cool, so you could get in that nice, easy, you know, an extended trot or a nice, easy canter. No galloping off of 
uh, four wheelers and things like that. But just let the dog dictate its pace um, by walking through fields or, um, you know, every once in a while if it was cold, I'd get in a Suburban and I would turn, put down four dogs and just, I would just kind of idle along and let them run back and forth in the field at their own pace. Okay. And that's my objection with yeah. a four wheeler yeah. running them on a four wheel. People think, well, I'll run him really fast. No, 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 no. That's, that doesn't build up stamina. And a lot of times it causes injury, mm -hmm. but uh, start in the spring and get your dogs to where they can take a, um, you know, a 45 minute gallop at their own speed and they'll slow down when they get tired and then they'll speed up again. But um, they're developing their lung capacity and they're building up their muscles uh, and tendons and ligaments and stretching and doing all the good things. And then in the summer, it's swimming if you can. Get yeah. them into ponds. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, they love uh, water exercises, you know, a lot of bumper retrieves um, and, and uh, put out bumpers around a big pond and then go get the dog and send it across the pond on a, with a search command or a, not a fetch command unless you have direct line for the dog and you can interfere and give it or, or you can intercede and help the dog. But generally a search command, you know, there's five bumpers. You could spend an hour and a half at the pond, so take a folding chair and a book and an apple, sit there and let the dog run around and find every single bumper. You know, good dog, and the dog's having fun, and it's swimming, and it, and you're, and you're uh, giving the dog a lot of exercise. Um, but in the fall, it's very, very important to do a lot of uh, trotting and easy cantering with the dog before you go hunting. There's nothing worse than w waiting all year and spending your money and going someplace with your buddies, and you're out on the grasslands, and you put the dog out, and he gets out there and, um, you know, you're an hour back and there's no water, there's no ponds and you've got to carry the dog out or yeah. he, or he, he, uh, twisted an ankle or he pulled a muscle or something like that and he can't walk. Now you've got to carry him out. And worse than that is you don't have your hunting buddy Yeah. because yeah. Uh, you were short, you know, you, 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 you shorted on his preparation. And take a little bit of weight off of them. You, yeah. you know, you don't want them. You don't want them rail thin because they burn up so many calories in a few days of hunting. Uh, it's it's quite unbelievable unless you've actually seen it. But they burn up calories like mad. So don't have them rake thin. Yeah. Um, they need some calories to burn. Um, How do feed you... them feed them well? But the another big. I'm sorry to interrupt there, but no, I but... think this is important. Do not expect that your one dog is going to hunt eight hours a day for you for a week. Yeah. That, that is just unrealistic. Uh, you, you can't, a, a dog can't do that. Um, and you'll hurt him. Do you feed in the morning? I feed twice a day. Even Always. on a hunt day? I do. Yeah. I, I feed them very, very early. Okay. Um, they get, they get dry food. They need energy. Um, they need that food going through their gut, uh, but I don't feed them a half hour before I'm going to take them out and hunt them. Yeah, Do you, you know if they're going to if they're going to if they're going to start at eight thirty, they're they're fed at four thirty or five. Yeah, and um, sometimes uh, depending on the weather, you know, they might get a um, little bit of chicken, a handful of chicken uh, or turkey at lunchtime, okay. and then right. uh, in the evenings when they're done. Not as soon as they're not as soon as they come out of the field, their body needs to cool down and they need to rest, and then they get, um, you know, dry food yeah. again, another yeah. meal. Yeah. Would you um, boil it down for us? And and this might be a good uh, way to end this discussion. We'll have another one. I'm I'm hoping down the road. Um, if you had to boil it down to one basic training philosophy that will impact a dog's hunting career and their human's hunting career. Could you, could you crystallize that for us? A, a, hunt, a training philosophy? Yeah, yeah. A relationship with your dog. You want your dog to want to hunt for you. And... And dogs, here's the thing. You can never lie to a dog. 
and I've seen it so many times, Scott, somebody will walk up to one of my dogs and say, oh, you're a good dog, you know, three pats on the head, and, and, and then they turn away. And a dog will shy away from that hand because he knows the guy's lying. <laughs> a dog knows A dog knows that that guy absolutely doesn't give a rat's behind about whether the dog did a good job or not. And the dog isn't going to want to hunt for him. Yeah. The dog hunts because it's in his heart to do so. But the trick of a really good handler, owner, trainer is to get into that dog's heart and, and say, I know you're going to hunt. You're a well-bred dog. You're a good dog. But I want you to want to hunt for me, not because you've been, you've been corrected with an e-collar, not because I've been harsh on you or you've got a whipping. I want to figure out a way with you. Look into his eyes and just say, with you. I want to get in your heart so that you want to hunt for me. And when you can do that, you're, you're way ahead. You can do anything with a dog then. But that's something that most people don't get. They yeah. think they can control yeah. that dog because they've got the e-collar. No, that you, you're not even getting half of the utopia and joy of ho- owning a really good hunting dog until you can figure out how to do that words to live by from linda crawl uh pro guide pro trainer german hunt test judge uh one of the and a pretty good golfer too (laughs) maybe we'll cover that in the next edition but for now linda uh, as always great to talk with you someday we'll get back in the field together but uh thanks so much for being a part of the upland nation podcast Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, and any time, uh, any time at all, give me a call. And uh, thanks again, Scott. Good to talk to you. Same here. Be safe. Have a great season. Bye-bye. Bye. And the rest of you, of course, uh, have got more to talk about here on the Upland Nation podcast, including uh, you, how your weekend went. You know, we're going to talk about uh, what was the opener for most people. It's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, First, uh, a word of uh, support from our friends at Pointer Shotguns. You know, they have a new uh, website, PointerShotguns.com. All the models, uh, some of my videos and articles, uh, don't forget there is a new side-by-side to come. But I thought it was important that you know that they're, they're in there deep with you. They're with us. They're supporting the same organizations we are from the Rough Grouse Society, the Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, the Youth Shooting Sports Organizations, Cal Waterfall, Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfowl. Pointer Shotguns is a big player in their banquet programs. They are basically helping all those organizations raise money, and giving those guns away at incredible prices so that we can support the conservation efforts that are important to us. Thank you, Pointer Shotguns. Learn more about them at PointerShotguns.com. Yeah, I love uh, learning more about what you're doing out there and uh, with the opener for many of us taking place just last weekend. Thought it would be fun to share some of your on the ground reports <laughs> i asked a question on our social media pages how was your weekend and then share a picture to drool over so i got some great ones of my started with mine that is uh uh flick in a little draw in a little um piece of the southeast oregon desert hills landscape with some great uh um dramatic rim rock in the background a little bit of green as we go up the crease between the two ridges there he's looking back at it wondering why i'm calling him in when there might be birds way up there but you all had some great reports as well mike augello said the dog did great (laughs) his shooting and not quite as uh good as the dog's work travis hampton Got a bonus grouse while hauling a buddy's bear out. You know, I, I've never done that. I have buddies who haul bears out all the time. Knock wood, I've never been asked to help. 
Dina Lawrence got three woodcock, but the king, and by that I think she means the rough grouse, remains elusive. Looks like she's got a little um, Gordon setter in the foreground there with the three timber doodles. Oh, beautifully colored leaves on the floor. Uh, they're just resting after a long hunt, and it, it is such a quintessential uh, forest floor for early fall. Jenny and Preston Gardner say they got grouse for Nell, who's the mom, and for Ruby, the daughter as well. It looks real good. Um, tailgate shot, classic tailgate shot. To uh, kind of hard to tell. Um, short hairs, probably. They might be pointers now. They think about it. Those noses. They did a good job on on uh, sharp tails there. Great day at the Miller Ranch for Steve Fryer. Some. Um, uh, in fact, I think, Steve, you also sent me a note on this. This is a shot of uh, the three of you, including your dog, and I think it's a nephew on his first hunt. Congratulations. Uh, I know you're active in our Fur Feathers Friends Initiative, and that is a perfect example of how it's supposed to work. Celia Rausch, you're always so artistic with your shots. Uh, this is beautiful. Uh, some pheasants uh, displayed in an ascending manner against an old barn wall, which means at least one board has fallen off the wall to put them up in that way. It's beautiful. And who doesn't love old barn wood? And then another one in a little niche with some uh, prairie grouse and some, yeah, those are Huns in there as well. Beautiful shots. Everybody go. This is on the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Some incredible shots by Celia. David Johnson took his pup out for first hunt. <coughs> Looks like it was very productive. Good dog. Wire hair. Beautiful looking young wire hair. All legs and feet. And a nice display of uh, pheasants in the background there. Pretty place. <clears throat> no birds, lots of fun at the Cochran household. Three kids in blaze orange. It looks like a dark brown liver um, short hair. And a safely held shotgun. Maybe you watched the video recently. Bert Spence, nice frame up there. <clears throat> no bragging, but there's four pheasants. There's a shotgun. And somewhere back there is a very happy, uh, check me, Bert. Would that be an Epignol Breton? I'm not quite sure, but very happy. Miss Betty is only nine weeks old. Looks like a short hair pup with an all dark head. Maybe it comes out of that Nebraska kennel I love so much. Travis Hampton clue me in on that, but Miss Betty wanted that grouse herself. I bet she didn't find it, but you're working her just right. Beautiful stuff. Everybody's having a good time. Sharpies in the morning in South Dakota during the resident opener for Chase Jansen. Limited pheasants by the end of the day. Yeah, yet another reason to move to South Dakota. Everybody keep up the good work. Some beautiful stuff out there. Thank you so much for sharing. Pictures are worth a thousand words here at the Upland Nation podcast. We know that and we know why we're out there just creating memories. And that's one of the ways to do it. We're brought to you in part by truelockjokes.com. You know, these guys have resources of all sorts. Even if you don't pattern your own gun, look at some of the examples of their pattern paper and you'll understand how important it is. Maybe you'll get out to the range and do it. You don't need to go to the range. Get a refrigerator box or just a big piece of cardboard and do something just to learn where the holes are in your pattern. And if you don't like what you see, then go to truelockjokes.com and get one of these bargains. You spend more than $119.99, you'll get a free shipping on domestic orders. Receive a free choke tube case on orders over $99.99. And a 10% discount on any Upland, Upland Bird choke tubes if you get three or more at the same time. It's all available at truelockchokes.com. Now it's time to say goodbye. First off, thank you, Linda Kroll, for getting me caught up on your life and giving us food for thought on everything from hunt tests to dog training, where to go and how to do it when we get there. It's so nice to talk with you again, Linda. 
Thank you. It's always nice to talk to everybody who listens in one way or another, especially through the comments at social platforms. So keep up that. Appreciate those who leave ratings and reviews. That's how we grow around here. We're all made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays, the Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and True Lock Chokes. Hey, this is the time of year when uh, if I'm not talking to you here, maybe I'll be talking to you afterwards, sitting on the tailgate somewhere in the field. Be safe out there. Thanks again for listening.